I'm Brent Blackwelder. I'm president of Friends of the Earth, and I'm going to be moderating a panel of four distinguished people, of, of which th we have three present now, and I'll introduce them in a, in a minute. I want to just, uh, uh, at the start, uh, recognize uh, three organizations uh, that are hosting uh, this meeting, and uh, I'll uh, give their name, and I'd then ask uh, the members of that to stand up so that if you want to speak with them afterwards, uh, you'll know who they are. The Citizens Climate Lobby, Marshall Saunders, Mark Reynolds, uh, and Steve Valk is back there. Okay. Uh, the Climate Crisis Coalition, Tom Stokes, Steve Kent, Dan Rosenbaum, Father Paul, Ibrahim uh, Rami. Uh, please all stand up for a second so people can see you. And Ezra Small. So raise your, yeah, you see who they are. Okay. Um, and then the Carbon Tax Center, we have uh, James Hanley and Dan Rosenbaum here. Okay, and uh, Charles Komanoff could not be with us, but is a prominent writer on the subject. And uh, yes, Rosen, Rosenboom. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, and then the sponsoring organizations, the Friends Committee on uh, National Legislation, uh, Progressive Democrats of America, uh, the Clean Coalition, We Act for Environmental Justice, Price Carbon Campaign, and Friends of the Earth. Let me just uh, say a couple words initially about why Friends of the Earth has been involved in the subject of carbon taxing and indeed looking at the tax code as a driver of behavior and the fact that from start to finish uh, it tends to reward things that are uh, polluting and considered harmful and, uh, and tends to penalize those things that are renewable, sustainable, clean and healthy. We've got to change that. And going back a decade ago, Friends of the Earth published a book calling for a broad-based energy tax, a carbon tax with a re commensurate revenue neutral reduction in payroll taxes. And we noted that actually in our survey of the nation, people like the idea of, of that because they, review, uh, they, they thought that carbon taxes was in the version of a sin tax or a harm charge, just the way we uh, penalize alcohol and tobacco. And uh, we, we'd hoped to get more traction, but recently, uh, in this century, we've had uh, basically a driving model being cap and trade. Uh, and we're going to be presenting another option today. There were, have been, in the, in the House side, other pricing of carbon hybrids uh, that have been introduced by several members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, then, over the winter, we became alarmed uh, about the real nature of what's going on with cap and trade and issued this report, Subprime Carbon, making the analogy with subprime mortgages and the financial meltdown. This can be downloaded from our Friends of the Earth website. So today, we're going to come to grips with um, climate destabilization and the way to address it. And we've got our panelists who are really going to uh, go into this in depth. I'll just mention their names now and do introductions as, as uh, they come up. Uh, and our first speaker will be uh, with the world-renowned uh, climate scientist, uh, James Hansen. Uh, next will be Robert Shapiro, former uh, deputy, uh, uh, a former U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce, and Janet Milne, uh, professor of law at Vermont Law School. So we'll start uh, with... Uh, Dr. Hansen. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I should um, make clear that I'm, uh, I'm speaking as a private citizen, although I'm a government employee. And uh, Unfortunately, my, my affiliation was listed in some of the prior uh, information for this meeting, which it shouldn't have been. It should, uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> when I speak as a private citizen, it should not be using um, the NASA affiliation as an advertisement. Okay, um, I'm going to, because the time is limited, I'm gonna take it as a given uh, that um, people understand that uh, global climate change and global warming is a, a real issue. And the president and the majority of uh, Congress people 
uh, understand that. Uh, so just let me say a, a few words about, about um, climate. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's really a difficult uh, situation for a political system because, for a couple of reasons. One is that climate is embedded within uh, the weather climate system, and weather fluctuations from day to day can be 10 or 20 degrees, and, and natural climate uh, fluctuations from um, month to month and year to year are, are quite large also. So it's hard for people to recognize that uh, things are changing, but they are. And um, the this characteristics of the system are just what you need in order to have a, to create a crisis. Because the climate system has inertia, mainly because of the deep, the four kilometer deep ocean, so it doesn't respond quickly as forcings are applied, human or natural. So the upshot is that although we're steadily increasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the system has only partially responded to those. There's more that's in the pipeline even if we stopped our emissions today. So that's one problem. And the other uh, characteristic of the system, which we now understand very well from looking at the history of the Earth, and that is that the climate system has tipping points beyond which things can begin to occur quite rapidly and without any additional forcing. So, for example, if an ice sheet begins to collapse, then the dynamics takes over. And, it, and you, changing the greenhouse gases doesn't matter then because once, you know, you can't build a wall around a one kilometer thick ice sheet once it starts to collapse. So it's really... Uh, and the political system doesn't tend to take actions until it really sees that they're needed. Uh, but, you know, we, what has become clear, and in, in really in just the last few years, is that we're a lot closer uh, to major problems than we thought, even just a few years ago. Uh, we, we can see things happening um, all around the planet. The mountain glaciers all, all around the world are receding rapidly, and most of them are going to be gone within 50 years. And that's, uh, that itself is a big issue because the, in, the, in the summer and fall, those melting glaciers supply more than 50% of the water in the, the major rivers of the world, like the Ganges and Brahmaputra, and, and rivers originating in the Rockies also, in the Andes. Uh, we see that uh, the, the subtropics is expanding by four degrees of latitudes, having an effect on the southern United States and Mediterranean region in Australia. We see that the uh, coral reefs are under stress. Uh, they're the sites of about one-third of the species in the ocean, and they're, they're under stress because of the acidification of the ocean from CO2 and from the temperature, climate change, uh, among other things. Um, we see that the ice sheets are not stable. Greenland is losing mass at a rate of about 150 cubic kilometers per, per year, and uh, West Antarctica is also losing mass rapidly. So anyway, there, there, there's a lot of uh, clear evidence that uh, things are really uh, starting to happen. Uh, now, um, and could I have the first chart? And, and uh, one of the, and the big conclusion uh, before I talk about this chart is that's become clear only in the last few years is that the dangerous level of atmospheric carbon dioxide is a lot lower than what we thought. And in fact, we're already into the dangerous zone in the sense that if we left atmospheric greenhouse gases at what they are now, we would eventually have large changes as the ice sheets become more unstable, for example. And as we put more uh, pressure on, on species on the planet. So that the target atmospheric carbon dioxide that we should be aiming for is no more than 350 parts per million. And we've already increased it to 387 parts per million. And we published a paper on this last year, but there have been other reports uh, this year from national academies, uh, the major national academies, uh, around the world and, and other reports that make this clear that the problem is more urgent than, than we thought. And now here's, uh, 
I, and I want to make just uh, two really major points. Uh, uh, but one of them, uh, the, the, the point is um, that, you, you know, we can't make laws uh, that will be successful if they're inconsistent with uh, the physics or with uh, the geophysical constraints. Uh, and um, so here's, uh, here's one of the constraints. Uh, that is the amount of carbon in the different fossil fuels, in oil, gas, and coal. And the, the purple portions of these bars are the part that we've already put into the atmosphere, the, the fraction of these uh, fossil fuels that we burned and put in the air. And that's what's increased the CO2 from 280 to 387 parts per million. There's some uncertainty as to how much is left in the ground for each of these, for oil, gas, and coal. Uh, most people, a, a lot of experts think that we're close to peak oil, which would mean we've used about half of the readily available oil. But maybe there's more than that if we go to the extremes of the Earth, uh, the, uh, the deepest ocean and the, the polar regions and things. So there's some uh, disagreement as to about how much there is left. But, and the same is true for the other fossil fuels, but what is, what is uh, crystal clear is that we cannot burn all of the fossil fuels, or even half we, of the fossil fuels, and put that CO2 in the atmosphere without pre creating a completely different planet, without sending the planet toward the ice-free state with sea level 250 feet higher. So, it, and it would take a while for the ice sheets to collapse and melt, but we would set the planet on a course which are, would be out of control of, for our children and grandchildren. And so we can't, we simply cannot do that. And, um, you know, when I've pointed this out, uh, let, let me go to the next chart. I, um, how much time have I used? You've used about eight minutes. Okay. So, so <laughs> well, the, the other thing on that, uh, is the oil and gas is very convenient fossil fuels, and you know, they're going to be used. The red, the large pools are going to be used. They're owned by Russia and Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries. They're going to get used, and it doesn't matter that much how fast you use them. You can slow down the rate at which you're using them a bit, but the lifetime of CO2 is very long, so you can't solve the problem by using it a bit slower. You've actually got to leave most of it in the ground. And what does that imply? That implies the coal, and there's another bar that I didn't show for unconventional fossil fuels, tar shale, tar sands, also a very big bar. Those have got to be left in the ground. Or, in principle, you could burn the coal and capture the CO2 and put it back in the ground. But you cannot put the CO2 of we've got to cut off the coal source, the, the large, uh, largest source, because the oil and gas, uh, it, um, it's impractical to capture uh, CO2 coming out of the tailpipe of a vehicle. So if we did that, if we said we're going to capture the CO2, we're going to uh, phase out coal between 2010 and 2030 linearly so that by 2030, we've cut off the coal emissions either by stopping using it or by capturing the CO2 and sequestering it. Then CO2 would, uh, the emissions to the atmosphere would decline quite rapidly as oil and gas uh, were depleted. And it, the, the red or blue curves depends upon whether you're the optimistic or the pessimistic estimate for how much uh, there is left. Now, so my third and final chart, if I could have that, shows uh, what the resulting CO2 would be. Well, if we cut off this coal source, then the peak CO2 would only be about 400 ppm if the 
lower estimates for the reserves are right, or if the optimistic ones are right, it would be about 425 ppm. And, and it is a lot harder. And then you could get back to 350 ppm by means of improved forestry and agricultural practices. Uh, I mean, reforestation and uh, better agricultural practices so you, you reduce the loss of carbon from the soil. But it becomes an awfully lot harder if you the large estimates for uh, oil and gas are right. In other words, there is a, a big disadvantage in going to the extremes of the earth to get the last drop of oil. It doesn't make much sense because the difference between the red curve and the blue one is 30 parts per million of CO2. Well, estimates, we're gonna, we would have to figure out a way, our children would have to figure out a way how to get that CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the current estimates are, well, there are ideas about how you can do that, and the estimates are about $200 a ton. That means that 30 ppm is $12 trillion. So we would be giving our children a burden of a $12 trillion worth of solution, and, 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 and also the impacts of that. Even if you take it out, it's going to have impacts before you get it out of there. Uh, so uh, that... So the uh, bottom, uh, the, so major point number one is we have to cut off the coal source. If we didn't, that's the, that's the result if we do phase out the coal over the next uh, 20 years. The second major point uh, is, I'll introduce by pointing out that last year Al Gore uh, made a um, innovative suggestion that we should, over the next 10 years, redo our electric grid and, and, uh, and really have a major program to get all of our electricity carbon-free, phase out coal completely over 10 years. And that's what we need to do. Um, now, then, then look at what uh, Waxman Markey. It, it makes almost no progress whatever in that direction, and yet Al Gore has given it his approval. So something's completely inconsistent there. Um, and I had a um, discussion with the German minister, environment minister, and he agreed on the science. And he said, yeah, we have to... He agreed that we're already getting into the danger zone. We've got to. And so what is their answer? Their answer is cap and trade. And at the same time, building a dozen new coal-fired power plants. And I said, wait a minute. That's, if you do that, then that means you have to convince Russia to leave its oil in the ground. Uh, and... There's no, and, and, he, and of course he had no answer to that, uh, other than say, well, we'll tighten the cap, but it, it doesn't help. Tightening the cap may slow down the rate at which you use the oil and gas, but you, you're still going to use it. So you have to cut off the coal. Um, okay. And uh, my other uh, major point then is Yes, at the top of priority lists should be energy efficiency. And secondly, renewable energies. And along with that, improved electric grid, low loss grid, smart grid. Those should be the highest priority. Uh, most experts think that's not enough, even in the United States. But certainly when you look at India and China, which are using mostly coal for their electricity and are very rapidly increasing energy needs and it want to electrify, it's not, in, it's not likely to be enough. So you have to look at either continuation of coal or nuclear power uh, until somebody comes up with something else. And I think... Uh, that we, we made, we in the United States made a major mistake in 1994 when we cut off the R&D on fourth generation nuclear power right at a time when it was ready to make a first demonstration plant. The, the uh, current technology is second generation nuclear power, light water reactors. 
but the the technology that the companies want to w would make if a nuclear plants are approved now would be third generation nuclear power, which is uh, moderate improvements, but it's still the light water reactors. It's still burning less than one percent of the energy in the nuclear fuel. The other 99 plus percent is left in a waste pile, which has a half life of more than 10,000 years. A, a enormous problem. The fourth generation nuclear power has the advantage of burning more than 99% of the energy. So we would not need to mine uranium for centuries because we've got enough fuel and we've got an, and the other advantage of the fourth generation is it can burn nuclear waste. <clears throat> and that way it can solve our nuclear waste problem. So it, so it, the combination of third generation nuclear power and fourth generation nuclear power has tremendous potential which unfortunately um, you know, just because of the history of uh, the opposition to nuclear power has not, has not been exploited. I think that that is a mistake. I think that we have to at least look very hard at that and we should have, and, and that's my second major point, <clears throat> we should have um, uh, urgent R&D uh, demonstration of the uh, potential of nuclear power and work together with India and China because we still have the best expertise in the world. And India and China are eager to have next generation nuclear power, but they, they, we should work with them because otherwise I don't see how we're gonna get them off coal. Okay, so the final uh, point, uh, let me just, I, I'm going to leave the Waxman-Markey discussion and the carbon tax to the other people because I used my time. But I just want to m say that the offsets cannot be allowed. If you go back to my first chart, <clears throat> we actually have to cut off the uh, coal source. You, and you cannot replace it with offsets. You actually have to look at the geophysical boundary constraints. Offsets cannot be allowed or you're not you automatically do not solve the problem. Um, and the fundamental thing that is required in order for us to move from the current um, energy systems to the post fossil fuel era is that fossil fuels cannot continue to be the cheapest form of energy. They're only cheapest because they're not paying for the damage that they do to human health and the environment and the climate. But as long as they are the cheapest form, then no tricks like uh, that, no uh, any of the things in the Waxman Markey bill, that none of that will work. You have to have a higher price on fossil fuels or, or they're going to be used. As long as they're the cheapest form of energy, they're going to be used. Okay, thanks. Oh, one other thing, the, the, could I have the last chart? At this website, I have uh, a write-up, which got copied, although it was a draft. The, the draft was left on the table out there. This uh, strategies uh, to address global warming. Um, if you can get the final version, if you go to this website. <coughs> Yes, I, I might also mention uh, there at the at the desk there is a CD of uh, Dr. James Hansen uh, on climate, so you might pick that up. Our next speaker, Dr. Robert Shapiro, is the co-founder and chairman of Sonicon. He was the under uh, uh, secretary of the Commerce Department for Economic Affairs, distinguished economist and author, and. He will be uh, showing us all the advantage of how direct pricing of carbon can lead to a better future. Thank you. It's um, always a pleasure to share a dais or a room with Dr. Hansen as well as Dr. Milne and uh, Brent Blackwelder and now Cecil Corbin Marks, who's now joined us. Um, I start, to the Senate staffers in the room, um, I started my time in Washington in, as a Senate staffer. And uh, so I'm, I've tried to organize my thoughts in the way I tried to organize decision memos I did for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, which was where I started. Um, point one, Senator. 
Whether or not to act on climate change is finally a settled question. The American public now supports significant action and believes it's an urgent matter. If that weren't so, we wouldn't have passed legislation in the House and you wouldn't be considering it in the Senate. The big question now is how we will act on climate and how effective those actions will be. We know the two major alternative approaches here, cap and trade and a carbon-based tax. While this choice is usually framed in political terms, the choice is essentially and vitally an environmental and economic one. On one matter, the two approaches are the same. They rely on higher prices for carbon-based fuels to push people and businesses to prefer less carbon-intensive forms of energy and, and technologies and to create incentives for companies to develop new technologies and less expensive ways of, of uh, generating low carbon or carbon free energy. Uh, a carbon-based tax does, does this very directly, applying a levy based on the carbon content of the fuel. Cap and trade does it by providing energy producers and distributors with limited numbers of permits, that's the cap part, cap on the permits, to produce greenhouse gas emissions and allowing trading that reflects energy demand in order to determine the price of the permits. So they're both forms of taxes, but their effectiveness is very different. First, the price of carbon under cap and trade depends on the relationship between energy demand and the supply of permits. The supply of permits is fixed by the cap, but energy demand shifts all the time. And when it rises unexpectedly, because the summer is hotter than expected, or the winter is colder, or the economy is stronger, the price of the permits will rise sharply with it. Demand goes up, it gets near the cap, and then the price soars because there are more people who want it, uh, that is, want the right to burn energy than there are supply of permits. The same thing happens if the summer is cooler than expected, the winter milder, or the economy slower, the price of permits will fall sharply. Economically, this means that cap and trade introduces a new layer of price volatility in our energy markets, which is bad for the economy and additional domestic volatility that will usually amplify the volatility we already have in international energy prices. We know how volatile international global oil prices are. Well, that's a global phenomenon, supply, demand, and the actions of OPEC. Um, now we're going to add another layer of volatility on top of that, which will be domestic, and that will arise out of the cap-and-trade regime, and it will usually amplify the um, uh, volatility that's already in international markets. Um, that's unequivocally bad for the economy, unequivocally. More important here, it means that cap and trade doesn't produce a known and reliable price for carbon. And that undermines the basic strategy of getting people to shift away from carbon-based fuels. It's even more important for businesses considering large investments to redo their energy infrastructure or critically to develop new climate-friendly fuels and technologies, if they don't know what the price of carbon is going to be a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, um, and, in get, and again, cap and trade inherently produces large price volatility, uh, that is volatility in the price of carbon, as we've seen in both the European trading scheme and the acid rain program, it's much harder to figure out whether those large investments will make economic sense because you don't know what the price is going to be. Um, and when, when you can't figure that out, you get less of the investment. Um, the contrast to a carbon-based tax is very clear here. By definition, it produces a knowable price for carbon, which can be set at the level scientists tell us will enable us to meet our goal of reducing emissions. Um, the advocates of cap and trade respond that the carbon-based tax doesn't have a cap. Uh, so when the summer is hotter or the, cold, or the winter colder than expected, as energy demand rises, emissions will rise with it. That's absolutely correct. But every carbon tax proposal also includes adjustments in the tax rate to ensure that we stay on a path of sustainable reductions in emissions. So the cho choice here is pretty stark. 
energy price volatility that harms the economy and volatile permit prices that weaken the incentives to develop and move to climate-friendly fuels and technologies versus a steady price for carbon that's better for both the climate and the economy. Senator, decisions made. Um, the Waxman-Markey bill has, limits the upward volatility of its permits and the energy prices that lie underneath them in the same way the European trading scheme did. It provides so many exceptions and exemptions that the actual cap produces very little emission reductions at all. And therefore, you get less volatility. The single most important and controllable way we generate greenhouse gases is by using the cheapest and most carbon intensive fuel, coal, to generate most of our electricity, as Dr. Hansen has noted. Yet electric utilities won't have to pay for their permits under cap and trade, so they will have li little incentive to reduce their emissions. Why did the House give them such large privileges? The truth is, Almost everybody got some form of free or reduced price pass under Waxman-Markey. One reason is that they could. Cap and trade is so complicated and so little understood by the public that it becomes the perfect environment for horse trading by special interests. Well, members certainly know the mo that most Americans hate higher energy prices and only a s small minority here or elsewhere is willing to bear additional costs today in order to avoid larger costs some, sometime down the road. So to reduce those costs, uh, the Waxman-Markey bill sacrificed its environmental effectiveness. The only point of passing a climate program that's too weak to protect the climate is to create a false sense of achievement for politicians, while for the rest of us, it only delays real action at potentially very large costs to the climate. By contrast, a carbon-based tax is relatively transparent, making it harder for greenhouse gas producing interests to finagle a sweetheart deal at our expense. Doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it a little harder. Equally important, a carbon-based tax deals with people's resistance to bearing these additional costs directly. It applies the tax in a revenue neutral way by recycling the revenues as tax relief. For example, through cuts in the payroll tax, or through lump sum payments to households. That way, we change the relative price of energy based on its impact on the climate without making people poorer. That protects families, especially those in lower and middle income households, as well as the overall economy. And it works at least as effectively as a cap and trade program with teeth would. Um, my organization, the US Climate Task Force, used we, we rented what's called the National Energy Modeling System, the NEMS, which is the computer simulation used by the Energy Department to forecast energy markets and the economy. It found that a revenue neutral carbon-based tax that was equal to $50 per ton of CO2 would reduce emissions over the next 20 years a little better than last year's Lieberman Warner cap and trade bill, which in turn was much stronger than Waxman-Markey, and it did it without reducing GDP or costing jobs, again, because it recycled the revenues. Recent economic developments highlight another important difference between these approaches. Cap and trade creates a trillion dollars or so in new financial instruments, that's the permits, to be traded on the financial markets. When they talk about the trading, where do you think that's gonna happen? It's gonna happen on Wall Street. Here's what we know about how this would work. First, they would, they would be the focus of large-scale speculation because speculators make their money off of price changes, off of volatile prices, and cap and trade inherently, unavoidably, and inevitably produces high price volatility. The average change in the price of permits in the European trading scheme um, over, over its first three years of operation, it averaged 22% a month. That was its volatility, 22% a month. The acid rain program for sulfur dioxide, its permits have fluctuated over 15 years, an average of 17% a month. Think of that if all your energy prices were moving up and down that much. Well, that's the perfect environment for financial speculation. That's, I'm not criticizing speculators for it. That's how they make their money. Um, second, we know that this market would be vulnerable to large-scale insider trading and manipulation. That's because every large utility 
an energy an energy producer will become aware of shifts in energy demand, which in turn will produce shifts in the price of the permits before anyone else. That's perfectly natural. Um, that's the way it works. Um, it's instructive that the large energy companies with major trading operations in energy futures uh, are strong supporters of cap and trade. Um, I'm not naming them now, but if you ask me in q and A, I I will. Um, as is, of course, all of Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street has been the biggest supporter, it's consistent supporters of cap and trade for the last 10 years, because it's a new line of business. I'm not criticizing them for it, they're just seeing their interest. Um, while other energy companies that are much less involved in trading futures tend to prefer carbon-based taxes. After everything that's happened to our capital markets and our economy, is there any doubt that we lack the capacity to effectively monitor markets with millions of complicated trades every day? Um, and speaking of what's been happening to us, is there any sense at all in creating a trillion dollars in new financial instruments which would, would immediately produce derivatives and derivatives of those derivatives when we know the economic risks for the rest of us that such markets involve when the underlying asset is basic to the economy, like mortgages and energy, and subject to bubbles and large price swings. These are exactly the ingredients that produce the financial meltdown. Let's give cap and trade the credit it's due. It's become the vehicle for the first international agreement on climate change, the Kyoto Protocols, though that agreement didn't actually produce any reductions, and with a few exceptions, notably Japan and the United States allowed every large greenhouse uh, gas producer in the world to continue with business as usual. Uh, they did that through the way they created the base for figuring the, the caps. Um, and for more than a decade, cap, cap and trade has also been the policy embodiment of a public commitment to address climate change. Um, it served its purpose as a symbol. Now we're getting down to hard reality and it's no longer good enough. In fact, it could actually set back the critical effort. If we're allowed to be serious about protecting the climate, the best choice here, and it's not a close call in any way, in my view, is the policy promoted by Al Gore in his Nobel lecture and by most environmental economists, and that's a revenue neutral carbon-based tax. Thank you. Uh, our third speaker um, is a law professor at Vermont Law School, Janet Milne. Uh, she is the sponsor and uh, contributing uh, author to this book, which is out on the front table, The Reality of Carbon Taxes in the 21st Century. She comes with considerable experience at Capitol Hill because she was the uh, legislative director on tax policy for Senator Lloyd Benson when he was chair of the Senate Finance Committee in the early 1990s. Thank you, but I'm afraid you also gave me a promotion from Tax LA to, L to, tax, to legislative director, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, thank you for, for coming today. Um, I have a fairly simple message um, that can be boiled down to this. Activities beyond our borders are showing that the ta carbon tax approach is alive and it is viable. And for starters, I'd like to look at what's happening in Canada, in, the, in British Columbia, next. Um, just across our borders. In late May of 2008, the government of British Columbia enacted a carbon tax on fossil emissions from fossil fuels. It was part of its, the government's a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 33% by 2020, an aggressive target. Next. You can think about carbon taxes in terms of a fairly simple formula, the classic formula for any kind of a pollution tax. You've got a tax base. You define what it is that you want to tax. Then you multiply that tax base times your tax rate, and that generates the tax revenues. British Columbia uses a very broad tax base. Next. Um, it, focuses on the full range of fossil fuels that are burned in the transportation, residential, industrial, and commercial sectors. It's called a carbon tax, but actually it's a greenhouse gas tax. It applies to carbon dioxide emissions, but it also covers methane and nitrous oxide. 
each of them measured for tax purposes according to their carbon dioxide equivalent, which is what's relevant for climate change. So it's a very broad tax base with the opportunity, which the government has reserved, to add other greenhouse gases in the future. It's a broad enough tax base to cover, in British Columbia, 77% of their greenhouse gas emissions, according to recent figures from the Ministry of Finance. So this creates a comprehensive tax base, and very importantly, <coughs> the tax has only very limited and policy-based exemptions from the general rule that all fossil fuels will be taxed. It has, for example, an exemption for exports because those fuels will be burned outside of British Columbia, an exemption for interjurisdictional travel by air, um, over which the government probably does not have legal authority, and an exemption for feedstocks, which won't be burned. But very importantly, um, it does not have any special exemptions for specific fuels or specific users. Um, it's not riddled with special interest exceptions. It's retained its breadth and its comprehensive character. Next. So, kicking on to the next step, um, the tax rate. The tax went into effect July 1 of last year, 2008, at the rate of $10 per ton of carbon dioxide. And that tax rate will go up by $5 each year until it reaches $30 per ton in 2012. So since we're just past the first anniversary of the tax, um, the tax is now playing out at $15 per ton of carbon dioxide. Again, no special tax rates for particular fuels, just one flat rate that applies across the board. What does this rate translate into? For gasoline, the first year of the tax, it was nine cents a gallon. When it's fully phased in at $30 a ton, that will go up to about 27 cents per gallon of gas on top of the other provincial gas taxes. To put this in a, um, actually if you can go back, Thank you. Um, to put this in uh, the context of the U.S. and the, and the Waxman-Markey proposal, the bill, um, that the Mar Waxman-Markey won't take effect until 2012. And when the Congressional Budget Office uh, looked at the bill in its form last in May, um, it determined that the average trading price by 2019 would be about $26 per allowance, or $26 per right to emit one ton of carbon dioxide. Um, using last Friday's exchange rates, the tax for British Columbia at $30 a ton would translate into $26. So basically, this British Columbia tax rate is in the same range as the Markey, uh, Waxman Markey rate, but it's going into effect seven years earlier. Next. Then we get to the revenue side of the equation. The British Columbia proposal is a revenue neutral carbon tax. That means that all of the revenue that the tax generates is given back to the taxpayers, primarily in the form of a variety of different kinds of income tax relief. There's a refundable tax credit for low-income taxpayers, and it's paid out quarterly so that taxpayers don't have to wait till they file their annual return to get the benefit. There are lower individual income tax rates and lower business tax rates. And there's also an interesting twist to the requirement of revenue neutrality. The law says that the finance minister is, is charged with ensuring that each year all of the revenues are returned to taxpayers so the government doesn't end up accumulating a surplus for other purposes. And if the Minister of Finance does not produce a plan and introduce legislation to make sure that happens, the minister has to refund 50% of salary for that fiscal year. <laughs> um, another market-based based approach we could consider. Um, when, so that's basically the core of this tax. When David Hawkins from NRDC testified at last week's hearing before the Senate and Environment Public Works Committee, his written statement said, quote, some carbon tax proponents claim a tax would be a lot simpler than cap and trade, but this is the fallacy of comparing idealized concept to a flesh and blood bill, close quote. 
I think the British Columbia tax shows that the flesh and blood can live up to the simple ideal. Next. It's simple, it's comprehensive, it's straightforward, and it's quick. The law was enacted in late May of 2008. It was in effect um, less than two months later. And the tax has proven to be politically bulletproof in the parliamentary elections this spring. The tax was championed by the, the British Columbia Premier, Gordon Campbell, who is from the majority Liberal Party. And when it went into effect, the leader of the opposition party, Carol James from the New Democratic Party, launched a campaign calling for repeal of the tax and making the tax a major campaign issue in the election. Nevertheless, Gordon Campbell was uh, was re-elected in May for a third term, an unusual occurrence in itself, and his party maintained the majority of seats in the parliament. And now the opposition party has withdrawn its objection to the tax. Because this is a revenue, because the revenue neutral tax has only been in effect for a year, it's too early to tell what the environmental and economic impacts are. Those studies will be coming. But the sizable uh, degree of the tax suggests that it's a significant step toward internalizing the costs of greenhouse gases. And significantly, the government has retained in its plan um, the right to look at the tax rate and potentially adjust it after 2012 if it finds that it's not meeting its emissions targets. So this example shows that carbon taxes can be comprehensive, they can be simple, quick, and also political circumstances can vary from country to country. We should not automatically assume that they're politically lethal and therefore verboten. And it's not just British Columbia that's thinking along these lines. Some leaders in Europe are quite sympathetic to the carbon tax concept. French President Sarkozy said in late June that he wants to pursue Next, that he wants to pursue a carbon tax on emissions not covered by the European trading program. Um, and that trading program covers only 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. So he's talking about a carbon tax on the remaining 60%. So carbon taxes are part of the international debate now. That's not completely a new development in Europe. Um, a year ago, in early 2008, the European Council asked the European Commission to review its energy tax uh, system and to bring it more in line with the European Union's climate policies. The European Commission staff have been doing that, and the Brussels press in May obtained a draft of their proposal, their working proposal, which proposed a substantial carbon tax um, for the European countries in addition to the minimum um, energy tax currently required by the European Commission. These would be taxes undertaken by the individual countries. That's not, a yet, a that's not yet a final proposal. It's under internal discussion at the European Commission, but it shows that the European Commission is seriously reviewing the role of carbon taxes. So I would end with this thought. As discussions continue in the Senate and as we go into the negotiations at Copenhagen, we should not assume that cap and trade is the only way we can go. Others are thinking about it, others have done it, and we should as well. They are a good idea, as the president said, and now is the time to consider them. Thank you. This is the deputy director uh, of We Act for Environmental Justice. He's also co-coordinator of the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum on Climate Change. So he is going to give us a perspective of how uh, carbon taxes uh, can be beneficial to communities uh, uh, around the world. And then I will say after this presentation, we will have, uh, we will have half hour for questions for our, our panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to Brent and uh, all the other uh, panelists. Uh, really honored to be on a panel with all of you. And, and thank you for your wonderful presentations. Um, 
I'm going to start off by just giving you a little bit of background on our organization. We act for environmental justice. Um, we are a 20 year old organization as of last year. Uh, we have five key programs and we have 17 staff members who work really hard uh, on fighting for environmental action and environmental justice advocacy across uh, the city of New York, the state of New York, uh, and federally. We are really blessed in terms of our leadership. We have a very dynamic executive director who's actually here today. I wanted to recognize her, Peggy Shepard. Just wave a little, she's embarrassed now, but that's okay. Um, and I also wanted to recognize my co-coordinator, Stephanie Tyree of the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum. Stephanie has worked tirelessly over the last year and a half to really help us shape our Environmental Justice Leadership Forum. Second thing I'm gonna do is uh, give you a sense of the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum. Leadership Forum has been around for a little bit more than a year and a half. Uh, we have 38 member organizations. Thank you so much. Uh, we have 38 member organizations that cover 17 different states. And we, over the last year and a half, have been really working to raise an environmental justice voice on the climate debate that has been going on here on the Hill. Um, with very limited resources, uh, we have tried to come down and participate uh, with meeting with senators and meeting with uh, members of the House. Um, and we have uh, put out papers uh, that you can find on the WE Act website at www.weact.org. Uh, we've put out both a carbon charge paper and a paper around clean coal. Um, I wanted to say on behalf of those 38 organizations, um, it's a real honor that so many of you from the Senate staffers, I'm not sure how many of you are here Senate staffers, but please know that we will be coming to see you all again in the very near future, probably starting at three o'clock today. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really important to have the voice of the environmental justice movement in this uh, debate. Far too often when you look at the shaping of policy, particularly this, our most important policy, our climate change policy, our voices have been absent from the table. And that's really what the work of the forum has been about, to raise those voices, to raise the voices of low-income communities, communities of color, those who traditionally haven't been at uh, the center of this debate. That being said, I wanted to shift into my presentation and then talk a little bit about some of the challenges that those communities are facing and why we believe uh, the Forum believes, WE Act believes, and many other environmental justice organizations around the country believe that a carbon charge or a carbon tax, yes, we're not afraid to say it anymore, um, is a better policy than a cap and trade. Um, first off, you've heard uh, some of the economic reasons why uh, cap and trade is not necessarily a good uh, policy for climate change, but we want to put a human face on that. In many of the communities that we operate in, pollution is not just something that we can take lightly. It is actually, in fact, the very thing that is choking us to death. When you look at communities like uh, Diamond or Narco in Louisiana, or when you look at uh, communities like my own West Harlem in New York City, we are inundated with pollution sources. Those pollution sources often lead to our communities being uh, called or known as what are known as hot spots. And as a result of that, we have extremely high health negative health outcomes. So one of the things that we are very concerned about with regards to a cap and trade approach is that it actually commodifies pollution and that we believe that by placing this a cap and trade places a price on pollution and creates a signal that it is okay to pollute. We really feel that for communities suffering from the daily burdens of pollution that commodifying pollution is actually taking their health in in, and into, our, into policy's hands and making it, uh, and jeopardizing it. The other thing that you've heard about with regards to the cap and trade approach is the cap and trade is complicated and it is expensive and it's hard to monitor. For communities that labor under poor pollution laws or lax enforcement of pollution laws, we can ill afford a system that ultimately allows more of the same. Under cap and trade, the government will have to oversee and monitor thousands of polluting facilities uh, and create a huge it will create a huge administrative burden and a set of new costs on the federal government. 
Facilities are ultimately supposed to self-report in these systems, and their pollution levels opening are, are left open to corporate gaming. And that is making it less likely that they will actually decrease their levels of pollution. For us, we also believe that cap and trade is an undemocratic and non-transparent system. A system that is uh, very complicated and hard for the public to understand. One that holds corporations, that doesn't hold corporations and, gov and the government actually accountable. The private trading market is closed off to the public. Um, we, are, we feel that for this to be an actual system where there is transparency, we should have no trading on the market. In terms of uh, other ill effects of the cap and trade system that we are against, uh, profiting from the permit price is a significant problem. These are ways in which corporations can actually continue to benefit at the expense of communities. Emission permits are priced to create a market signal that facilities must pay uh, the public for the CO2 pollution. And when the government gives polluters uh, these permits for free, corporations avoid paying for their actions. And that is exactly what is happening under the bills that are going forth, the cap and trade bills that are going forth right now. Moreover, the public loses again when permits are first given away, and then the loss of tax money that could be generated by polluters paying for the permits. Second, they lose because facilities still pass on the permit price to consumers, a significant concern for those of us in low-income communities. Another major issue for us is the profiting from offsets. Polluters can avoid reducing their emissions by buying offsets in places, paying someone else to reduce carbon emissions so they don't have to. But offsets, all, almost, but offsets are almost impossible to verify and often cause more harm than good. Communities near facilities still suffer from the public health impacts caused by the local pollution, and the areas that receive offset projects suffer from the environmental, economic, and social harm that these projects often cause. Another point about offsets is that they actually foster a new round of what we in the environmental justice movement refer to as environmental colonialization. They actually rule off places of economic development for many countries outside of the United States and in essence create a development barrier for those nations providing us with, in the United States, an opportunity to actually continue to pollute while still retarding development in the rest of the world. Free permits, uh, low auction prices, and false offset create huge profits for carbon polluting facilities. This encourages uh, continued fossil fuel use and discourages our national shift to clean, green, renewable energy. For us, in vulnerable communities, we continue to suffer while corporations benefit. One of the key ways, as you heard me open up by talking, is with this issue of toxic co-pollutant emissions. A cap-and-trade system does not address the other local toxins that are emitted by polluting facilities, such as lead, mercury, black carbon, and other toxins. For communities, these pollutants create public health crises, like respiratory illnesses, heart disease, cancer, ultimately leading in some instances to death. Failing to address co-pollutants wastes a unique opportunity to have, uh, to address local and global impacts of air pollution. Unpredictable energy prices, which you heard a little bit about earlier, is also a significant concern for low-income communities. Right now, currently, Americans pay about a fifth of their income on energy. When we make facilities pay for their pollution through an auction uh, that, creates a price, that creates price volatility, every four months facilities bid on how much they will pay for their pollution, and this causes energy prices to jump. These jumps in energy prices hurt consumers, and in particular, those who are at the lowest end of the economic spectrum. Unpredictability in things like energy costs are not something that low-income communities can tolerate. 
Finally, in terms of con consumers, there are little protections for uh, consumers from higher energy prices. One of the things that the present bill allows, actually, is that it allows for some set-asides for the permits that are actually, the very few permits that are actually sold, to provide resources to help offset energy uh, costs or energy shocks. But what it doesn't do, it passes that money through to uh, local distribution companies without any requirements that they actually use those set-asides for the various stated purposes that they outline in the bill. So in other words, the local distribution companies can actually receive a windfall of profits, profits that are definitely intended to be used to help offset shocks, but there is no requirement that they do so. When we look at what this bill ultimately does, it does not does not, I repeat, does not reduce the amount of CO2. The, it actually really is not creating strong caps. And as a result of that, when we look at climate change and those communities that are most likely to be vulnerable, those that uh, Rajendra Pachari, the uh, chair of the IPCC said, would be those that are hardest hit, the most vulnerable communities across the world, and even right here in the United States, those communities on the front line of climate change will not be protected by this bill for the simple reason that it does not actually get to lower levels fast enough and to those levels that scientific community has said are the ones that we need to be hitting. Again, our communities are not uh, strangers to the lack of enforcement of environmental laws. As a result of that, when we look at what's going on with the bill ACEs, it really does, although create this huge new administration for figuring out how to monitor the system and trading of the permits, it does not really monitor and protect efficiently for environmental laws and environmental protection. In fact, we have seen under the bill as it goes forward that the EPA's regulatory authority has been gutted. And as a result of that, we are extremely concerned. I think when you look at this overall and you realize that uh, vulnerable communities, those that are on the front line of climate change, are looking at a bill that does not reduce CO2 fast enough at the right targets, does not provide protection for them from vulnerable uh, shocks in the electric market and the energy market, does not control for pollution hotspots, does not provide other types of consumer protection, barely provides any money for training uh, to the green economy, ultimately we're looking at a bill that not only is not good economically, it is not good environmentally, and for those of us in vulnerable communities, it certainly means that it is not good for us at all. I think it's important to, to uh, say that we have proposed a carbon charge, and I would encourage all of you to go to our website, www.weact.org, and look at our carbon charge paper. And one of the things that we do there is we start out by setting out a series of principles and then talk about the proposed solution of a carbon charge. For us in the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, this proposal has ultimately been one that we believe is a real pathway to a solution to this problem. Fundamentally, we believe that a carbon charge provides for stable pricing in the energy market. Because in our proposal, we do have an environmental review process that allows us to ultimately see where we are with regards to carbon uh, reductions in the environment based on the price that is set with the carbon charge. We believe that we also have a way of making sure that we're meeting the environmental targets that the scientific community believes are important. In addition to that, our carbon charge proposal puts forth options for recycling the revenue that's raised through the carbon charge into the economy in multiple ways, through training, through offsets that we consider important for allowing for education, allowing for green job and research and, and uh, green job, research and development uh, monies to go into green jobs and green jobs technology, and a variety of other things that also deal with public health, something that is solely not talk, sorely not talked about in this particular debate around uh, uh, climate. Lastly, I want to say that when we look at the fact that all of the polluting infrastructure, or a large and significant part of the polluting infrastructure, whether it's 
power stations or whether it's uh, ports or whether it's uh, diesel bus depots, all of these things are in the most impacted low-income communities and communities of color overwhelmingly. And if we are not talking about dealing with some of those particular problems uh, through this particular climate bill, uh, you will not really find a lot of environmental justice support. And fundamentally, I think it's important for the Senate at this particular point in time to really pick up the charge and recognize that communities are not protected by this particular legislation. To recognize that we have an opportunity to have a hearing on a carbon charge, uh, to open up this dialogue, and to po possibly try to transform uh, the solutions that are coming forward. And with that, I just want to close and say thank you. Uh, we're now going to turn to questions. Just let me uh, ask the Friends of the Year staff to stand up. Eric Pika, Ben Schreiber, Nick Burning. So if you have questions about any of, any of our work, you may uh, speak with them afterwards. Uh, we'll try to do a quick half hour of questions. Uh, so if you raise your hand and if you want to direct it to the panel as a whole or to one, just uh, let me know. Go ahead. Thank you all for your presentations. I learned a lot. I think it's very important. Uh, I do have one question. Um, I understand this is a revenue neutral uh, proposal, but how do the states and the federal government recoup the co uh, increased costs of energy that would come through this? Is that something that can be addressed? And I'd ask panelists to uh, repeat the question it, because it, people. I mean, would the state governments be negatively impacted by the increase in? energy costs and the federal government? Well, it's an interesting point. Oh. It's an interesting and, and useful point that um, state and local governments consume energy as well. And they would certainly be um, uh, subject to the, to, uh, to the tax. It would be a drain on revenues. Um, however, state and local governments are also supported by taxes, um, and that is they would be paying for that through the taxes they apply to um, their businesses and their residents, and their residents would be totally recompensed for the per person or per household cost. And so state and local governments, the easiest way to do it would be that state and local governments would recoup it through revenues from, um, from their residents who would be directly, uh, who would directly receive the revenues from the carbon-based tax. Mm -hmm. Might note, uh, Speaker Pelosi did a lot to reduce energy uses in the Capitol. So, um, she's actually saving a lot of money and has led the way to an extensive greening uh, of, of uh, at least the House of Representatives side and has pushed uh, with a protest at the coal burning plant here to move that entirely to natural gas. Next question back there, yes. Yeah, um, I, you know, I've heard, heard the arguments and everything and I think that still the primary, one of the primary barriers to getting a carbon tax passed is one of marketing. I mean, we live in a country where the word tax is a dirty word, and you know, even on the House, on the debate in the House floor of Waxman Mark, <coughs> all the people in opposition came up and said, this is a tax, and this is why they wouldn't support it. So how do we convince the politicians and their constituents who do not wish to take the time to truly understand the issue that this is the best course of action and it won't be politically lethal. Dr. Could, Hansen? Could I, um, is my thing on? Yeah. yeah. If it's I'd like to say something about both of these first two questions. Because that, that first question was an interesting one. Because if, you know, if you're giving back 100% of what you collect, then that, but the activities continue, then what that means, it seems to me, is that the state's costs are going to go up 
And if the public is funding the state, then the public is going to have to pay uh, to cover those costs. But what that means is that the dividend that is returned to the public would cover the increased cost. That's just what I said, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that just points out that the dividend is large. You know, I give this example of if you apply uh, a tax equivalent to a dollar a gallon, which eventually you'd have to get, you have to make, eventually the tax, the fee, and <laughs> to address the second question, I think we should have probably called it a fee and rebate or a fee and dividend rather than a tax and dividend because in either case, whether you're talking cap and, and trade or fee and rebate, it increases the cost of energy. So they're equivalent in that regard, and their effectiveness in changing our practices depends upon uh, that increase in the price of energy. Uh, but at that rate of a dollar a gallon, it generates, with the 2007 uh, statistics for our energy use, it would generate $670 billion. And you turn that around and give it back to the public, it's three thousand, approximately three thousand dollars per uh, uh, adult legal resident, and uh, with a family of two children or more, be nine thousand dollars. So it's a lot. It's a lot of money. And, but anyway, that's the comment I wanted to make. Can, let, let me just say that I think that the. Uh, I think that we have to come at changing uh, the, the Capitol Hill setup from a different perspective, and that is I think we have to really be getting out to people in communities and helping them understand some of what's going on here. I think fundamentally that when people understand this stuff, that they can hold their own elected officials accountable for making some of the change happen. And unfortunately, uh, you know, groups like mine and, and other environmental justice organizations really don't have enough resources to be uh, organizing the way that we know how to. Um, this requires mass organization. And um, you know, we don't have the kind of resources like moveon.org to get you know, thousands and thousands of Americans, but we're trying. And I think that's one of the ways in which you see change happen in Washington. Um, there are other ways, for sure, um, to appeal to you know, this interest and that interest and then cobble together a set of interests that ultimately, at the end of the day, sometimes represent you know, a so denuded uh, bill or a piece of legislation that you end up missing the mark, but um, I would say that you really have to go outside and attempt to sort of come back in with uh, folks who have a better understanding about these issues. Um, I also, it's, um, you know, look, th this is not really a different problem than healthcare reform faces. Everybody's for healthcare reform so long as it doesn't cost them anything. Um, it's the same problem, same political problem. Um, I think it means that you have to present it as what it is, which is not a tax increase, but a tax shift. Um, a tax on, um, on the emissions that are ruining the environment paired with a tax cut on people's work or people's income um, so that people understand that this is a tax shift and not a tax increase. Um, we have done recently focus groups, um, uh, a whole series, um, and we're going out in the field and going to do national surveys, um, in which we explain cap and trade and carbon taxes. And um, we found a very large majorities in each case favored carbon-based taxes. Um, they didn't trust cap and trade. They said it's a, you know, it's a scam. The big companies are going to game it. Um, their instincts, I mean, you know, we, we didn't tell them that. We just explained the way it worked, and the people's instincts were very good. Um, so uh, there, there is a marketing problem. There's a marketing problem for anything that involves costs on people. Yes, question? Yeah. Stephen Shackerman with Income Security for All, and the question I was prepared to ask, Dr. Hansen partially answered a moment ago, 
when he quoted the paragraph from his paper on uh, the effect of fee and dividend. And my question is, are you pushing this idea of a dividend? Because if we really promote, and that's what my organization is working to update, the ideas from Martin Luther King and others about a guaranteed income. And if we really put the issue of the dividend uh, at the forefront of our literature instead of buried within it, I think people will say, especially people in communities of color and those who are disadvantaged, that, oh, I'm going to get $3,000 a month. I'm willing to support higher taxes on carbon. And so I'm just thanking the panel and hoping that all of us will begin to think more about these larger implications and ways of gaining broad-based support by talking about the dividend more actively. Yeah, $3,000 per year, not m month. But I think that you do have to make it ironclad that the money is is going to go back to the public. Now, there you can discuss whether it's better to do it as a payroll reduction thing, but I think, it, and you could divide it, you know, it, but you have to then make it accountable. I like that example in Canada where uh, somebody's salary is reduced 50% if they don't, if they don't make sure that happens. Uh, it, it, some people, I, you know, I've received actually quite a few messages from uh, people on the conservative side who say, oh, this is income redistribution, and so I, 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 they don't want to support it. Well, uh, I, you, it, it is quite a lot, and, and people who are not but but on the other hand, I can see a lot of advantages to that. It's going to be stimulate the economy. But but as I say, you could divide it and say we're going to use half of it for payroll reduction, uh, reduce payroll taxes, and half of it for a dividend. But uh, you have to make sure that 100 percent of it is going back. Well, the whole idea you're trying to to get the shift from high carbon intensity users and families to low ones, so that's basically right. the objective. If they didn't get it, if they, that's, uh, that's war after, yes. Hi, I just wanna thank you for your comments today and I really appreciate your dedication to this issue. I can tell you're all committed to climate change, so then I have a question about that. Um, the waxman Markey bill has already passed the House, so they've made it one hurdle. And I was wondering, do you think it's better that something happens rather than nothing with climate change? Do you think, are you willing to let legislation pass by, the waxman Markey bill pass by to at least address climate change, or are you going to just wait another year or perhaps several years before this issue is addressed again? What do you think would be better? Um, I unequivocally think it would be better for waxman Markey to go down, to not be passed. Um, I think it's an empty achievement. I think it will delay real action on climate change. Um, I think it will also, as its adverse effects become clear because the public is not prepared for it, I think it will cause, could cause a backlash against climate change efforts. Um, uh, the, um, uh, this is checking a political box without the substance. Um, I think it would set back the effort to reduce the risks of climate change rather than actually reduce those risks. Um, it's, um, it, it's not true of any, you know, like a, y you could fashion a cap and trade program which, it was a, which, which would be effective. But we haven't seen one yet. Actually, we do have one example in the acid rain program uh, is an effective uh, cap and trade program. It has the drawbacks of all quantity-based regulatory regimes and the volatility of the prices, but um, it, uh, it has been effective. Um, so it's possible, and you could design a cap-and-trade program that began to look a lot like um, a carbon tax, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but this one is not an example of that. This has all the deficiencies that one fears in this kind of approach. Um, it would, we would have to wait 10 years to see how it worked. That, that would be the argument, particularly by all the interests who were getting windfall profits from it, not only on Wall Street, but also in the energy industry. Um, it would be 2020 before we got down to serious action, and the action we would have to take at that point would be very, very drastic and difficult. I might add that Friends of the Earth opposed the Waxman-Markey bill 
uh, be, for, the, for the very reasons stated. It, it locks in place a model that's not going to get us where the science says we need to go. And, and they did not address the serious issues of Wall Street gaming any kind of carbon uh, system. Let me ask, are there Hill staff that have not had a chance to get a question in here? Yes, could we take one? Uh, my question is for Dr. Hansen. You mentioned uh, that one problem with dealing with climate change as a, as a legislative approach is that we're going to hit a, a tipping point at some point. And you also mentioned that uh, the science that we have now has come a great deal just in the past few years. I'm wondering what exact, what uh, revel revelations have we had in the past few years that have made us realize that we might be closer to this tipping point than we thought previously? Yeah, there have been, uh, there have been several. Uh, the rapid loss of sea ice in the Arctic, which is much faster than had, had been expected, uh, the uh, the movement of the, the subtropics expanding by about four degrees of latitude. These things, both of these uh, are, are expected in the models, but it's just happening faster. Uh, the rate of uh, loss of uh, movement up the mountains of the mountain glaciers the, uh, is faster than had been expected. Uh, and and a lot of information has actually come from the improved knowledge of paleo, from paleoclimate. We've had uh, numerous examples in the real world of changes in the past and how sensitive the system was to changes in the boundary conditions, including atmospheric composition. And we've realized that the system is more sensitive than we thought several years ago. Are there any media or Hill staff that have not had a question? Yes. A uh, question for Jane Hansen. Um, have you been asked to testify at any upcoming hearings? Also, has there been any communication with you and the Obama administration? Uh, have, I have not been asked to testify at any upcoming hearings, I, I don't think. Um, um, and I have not. Uh, had any uh, interchange at a high level with the new administration. You know, I had written a letter to the president uh, at the time of just after his election and asked John Holdren to deliver it. But when he said that he wouldn't, he would, he said he would do it, but he couldn't do it until he was confirmed, which would take a long time, and so I just made it a public letter. Um, but anyway, that's the answer to your question. You didn't hear back? No, I did not hear back anything. Mm -hmm. Other Hill staff or media that haven't had a chance to get a question in? Okay, who, any other questions pending? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question that kind of segues from the previous questions. I know that there are two proposals uh, in the House right now, the uh, Flake Inglis uh, Lipinski bill and the Larson bill. And I was wondering if you get uh, the panel's opinion on that and if they have been participating with them to craft that legislation. Thank you. Does anyone com comment on Inglis Lipinski's uh, uh, bill? On Larson's bill, but not. Or Larson. Well, okay. On Larson's bill, I mean, our, the leadership forum has been in communication with uh, Congressman Larson's office, and we've tried to be supportive. Uh, we have a member uh, of the leadership forum in Connecticut. Um, while I have the mic, I just wanted to, well, I guess I should wait. I wanted to dovetail back to the acid rain program, because I think that that while it's been sort of touted as a model of success, and it has been, I think there's some fundamental key differences between the acid rain program and what's uh, up on the table at this particular point. One is that the acid rain program really had a fairly direct and clear path to what needed to be fixed. So there was a way forward. You had to put scrubbers on and you, you know, sul the low sulfur coal, uh, uh, convert to that and then get yourself in that program. Um, in terms of the cap in the acid rain program, it was uh, an allocation for a cap was based upon a, a standard established in the Clean Air Act, which from my standpoint is one of the strongest environmental laws that we have because it actually does tie into public health. Um, there were no offsets in the acid rain program, 
And uh, I think that's really critical for those couple of things that I just cited there. It's critical for people to understand. Um, the last thing I'll say about the acid rain program is that the scope of that program was significantly smaller than what we're talking about right now. So that enforceability, which is a key concern for the environmental justice community, uh, is something that we could literally wrap our arms around. I mean, we could get you know, to the, to the source of the problem. What we're talking about here when we talk about a cap and trade program, it's, it's much broader, it's much, you know, it's an economy-wide system and it, it is something that I think uh, should not be compared so easily. Um, a lot of the folks uh, on the cap and trade side like to banty about, oh, well, the acid rain program worked. Well, it worked for very specific reasons and stop pulling the wool over the public's eyes. The one um, comment I'd make about the, uh, the English bill, there is, there is some possibility of bipartisan support for a carbon tax uh, a measure. And if we, if, if we had looked at the House committees as they were shaping up, the House Ways and Means Committee with the set of new appointees in 2006 and 2008, as many members, it's no longer a wholly owned subsidiary of the U.S. oil industry. Uh, it's got people that might actually produce a far superior piece of legislation than emerged uh, here uh, from the Energy and Commerce Committee. With that very narrow vote in the House, we're looking at a very different situation and a dynamic there in the Senate. And so that if people start looking and enumerating all of the advantages of going straight at the tax code, uh, then I think that we will see something different emerging. Furthermore, it's not a case of all your eggs in one basket. There are many, many other things that can happen, not the least of which, with an aggressive administration, they have authority given to them now by the Supreme Court to pursue a vigorous uh, regulation of carbon dioxide under the Clean Air Act, whose authority, by the way, is removed by the Waxman-Markey bill. So it could be all out doing everything. Uh, Obama could be as assiduous in protecting the global environment and dealing with climate as the Bush administration was assiduous in removing health and environmental safeguards from every department. It's, and that simultaneously will put pressure on Congress. If you don't like that, come up with something that will work better. There are many options, and you can pull apart some of the things that were in the climate bill that are not part of cap and trade. It's about time we did set renewable energy standards that make sense and do better than the status quo, things like that. So we're not just crippled if it's all this or nothing. We have a, we have a much more imaginative population here of people with great ideas, so we ought to be uh, pursuing them. I'm president for Poly Trade International Corp. And I know we've been talking a lot about carbon dioxide and how it has to be taxed, and ministers and everybody wants to tax it. What we need to talk about, I think, and I don't know why we're not, is there are a lot of very good technologies out there that will help to reduce emissions and will help also to give uh, fuel efficiency. And if you have efficiency, energy efficiency, if it's, let's say, 25 percent like my company can do, okay, if it has 25 percent efficiency in energy, that means you're going to have 25 percent less carbon dioxide going up there, even though it doesn't reduce the carbon dioxide itself. The other thing with the, with the uh, Waxman-Markey uh, bill that's being debated right now in the uh, Senate is that, you know, I looked at that and there's a lot of, lot of money that's going into like carbon sequestration, okay? Mm -hmm. But for small businesses like me, I can't even find any money for something that mm -hmm. does work today and all they gotta do mm -hmm. is just use it. Dr. Shapiro, so why don't we have funding well, for that? Why don't we put that in there? The whole, the, point of a carbon-based tax is to change price relative prices so that there is a much greater incentive to turn to the kind of technologies, both energy more energy efficient and climate friendly technologies you're describing. The problem today is we don't put a price on carbon, so there is no economic incentive to do so. The carbon-based tax creates that incentive. Um, and um, uh, 
Janet? Um, also, we have, just through the economic uh, stimulus packages, about $80 billion between the legislation last fall and the legislation um, early this year that's going into energy efficiency, renewable energy, a variety of climate programs. About half of that, about $40 billion, is going through the tax code, through tax incentives, and about half through the Department of Energy in spending programs. That's on top of tax incentives and other programs that already exist. So I think um, it's very important, as, as was said, to send the negative signals, um, but at the same time, I think we can't overlook the fact that the government is also making some fairly unprecedented expenditures on the incentive side. Tom Stokes, <laughs> Climate Crisis Coalition. First of all, uh, we have quite a few lunches still here. So if anybody <laughs> wants to take any with them, if you know of any soup kitchen or anything, please, uh, not everybody obviously had lunch, and we hate to have them go to waste, so please help yourself. Uh, just to put this whole debate in a little bit of perspective, uh, when we um, had a strategy meeting at Friends of the Earth in January. This was after the December briefing that we had with uh, both Dr. Hansen and Dr. Shapiro and others. Uh, we sort of looked ahead at what we might reasonably be able to expect to do this year. And I think pretty much we had the consensus, there was a consensus there that as much as the arguments were on our side for the carbon tax or pricing carbon, this year, the political reality was is that cap and trade was going to predominate. But our job was to keep on reminding people about the plan B that was there in the wings. And it seems to me that pretty much what we thought would happen has happened. Uh, but let's keep in mind that the bill that passed the Congress passed with the barest possible plural plurality, excuse me, a tremendously compromised bill. And if we step back for a second, I think we should accept the fact that we're actually in a fairly good position now to be pursuing the agenda for carbon B, for plan B. And that we really, it's incumbent upon us to work as best as we can with the Senate, with the conference, and also the fact that let's accept that we may not have a climate bill regardless of Copenhagen this year and we should be back next year really presenting ourselves with a much stronger plan. So I, I think that uh, this is not a time, you know, certainly it's discouraging to see such a weak bill put forward there. So many people saying, oh, this is a step forward when many of us think it's a step backwards. But if we look at from a broad perspective, um, it's really more time than, uh, timely than ever to be pushing for what is really a viable, equitable alternative. And I think uh, the people here today have spoken very well to that fact. 